Graham, welcome to the stage, please. Jordan Murray. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> right, who here likes space? Okay, thank God. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> okay, it's going to be an easy night. Okay, it's all right. Um, right, so, uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah, my name's Jordan Murray. Um, I'm a uh, spacecraft propulsion engineer at Airbus, uh, which is like the geekiness of geeks. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to give a talk tonight. Hopefully, you'll find it interesting about uh, what I do from a day, like day to day basis. And I work on the Mars sample return mission. So that's what this presentation is about. Um, right, so I'm going to start off with a bit of a space quiz, because we all like space quizzes, right? So, um, how far away is the moon? So, kilometers, miles, go on. Who wants to shout out? It's Best just guess? Out there. Huh? It's just, out there. just out there. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> 120, three, oh, close, very, very close. 32,000, no, no, a bit further, but you were, yeah, you were close. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll give you this one. So it's, it's 385,000 kilometers, you're pretty close. Uh, and this is 260,000 miles for those old schoolers out there. Um, and it takes light 1.3 seconds to, to reach uh, the moon from Earth. Um, so it's still, you know, still a bit, of a, a bit of a delay. It takes us, via conventional rocket technology, uh, three days to reach the moon. So by conventional, I mean chemical. And that's normally how we get around in space. We get around in space by what we call the Hoffman transfer. So this is a, a geeky way of uh, basically saying uh, the, the most efficient way to get from point A to B. So um, over here we have uh, the perigee of Earth, uh, which basically means the closest point to Earth, it's space terms. We burn our engines here and we extend our apogee, uh, the furthest point away from Earth. Uh, and then when we enter um, the, uh, the moon's sphere of influence, uh, we burn our engines again, so we perform a braking maneuver and this captures us in moon's gravity and then we orbit the moon. That's basically how we get around or how we get to the moon. All right, next question up. Uh, how far away is Mars from Earth? Hang on, I'm just trying to remember now. What is it? What is it? <laughs> no, it's not that. <laughs> any, any other guesses? 50 million. 50? Oh, yeah. Almost. Bang on. Almost. So, I mean, the answer is very, very, very far away. So, um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people think that Mars is closer than it is. So, we often hear, why can't you just go, you know, we, we've been to the moon, why can't you just get to Mars? Well, this kind of shows why. So, Earth, Moon, this is all to scale. Mars is right over there, way, way away. Closest approach is 54.6, so you're bang on. He just happens to be my, my friend, but he, he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, quizzed up before. And, uh, <laughs> um, that's the closest approach. That figure there is actually, I mean, it, it's a theoretical figure. It's never been achieved in Earth's sort of lifetime um, just because of Mars's, Mars and Earth's different orbits. The real figure in terms of like the closest approach during our lifetime is 57.6 million kilometers, just an extra three million kilometers. Um, but I mean, it takes, it takes light uh, three minutes and two seconds to reach, well, to go from Earth to Mars. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite a distance. Um, it takes us, if we were to go via normal conventional technology, I mean, I give you a range of times so there, I'll tell you why. 155 to 333 days to get to Mars. And there's a range there because uh, it all depends on different spacecraft mass. Um, the, the launch trajectory has a big impact on how, on how quick we get there. Um, and what, what was the other one? Uh, oh God, I can't remember now. Uh, but yeah, it just takes a long time. Um, <laughs> So, uh, uh, yeah, the closest approach only occurs um, uh, when we have this, 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 uh, this phenomenon called opposition, which is when Mars and Earth are on the same, same side as the Sun and they're aligned. And this occurs every 26 months, every two years. This is why in the news you'll see like a flurry of Mars missions all launching at the same time. 
but making the most out of this closest approach uh, phenomenon. Um, just to put it for, you know, in perspective for you, the, the furthest distance is 250 million kilometers. So if we were to attempt it then, it would take us about 2,000 days to get to Mars. So we burn our engines from, from, from Mars, and then as we get to Mars, we have to do this very critical burning maneuver, braking maneuver, and then we're captured in Mars' uh, sphere of influence, and then we perform subsequent braking maneuvers at the perigee of the orbit, and that brings us very close to Mars uh, in a circular orbit. All right, last space quiz question. I know you're all going to be really sad about this. Um, how many Mars missions have launched, and what percentage have been successful? Come on, just shout out. Five and 100% wrong. <laughs> I'll be kinder to the next person, I promise. Yeah. 12 and 50 percent. Uh, the, the second part is right. No, okay. I, I thought I told you before. <laughs> no, it's more, it's more. So we've had 48 missions, which is quite a lot. But yeah, you're right, sir. It was 50 percent. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm calling you sir, but yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, 50% has been unsuccessful. That's still, that's still quite a lot, uh, and I'll explain why later on. So, um, we've had 17 missions out of those 48 that have reached the surface of Mars. Um, five of those have just smashed into smithereens on the surface, you know, basically been a meteorite. 13 have landed successfully, but some of them have lasted, like, seconds, minutes, you know, so there's a little bit of a, uh, a caveat to that successful term. Six rovers have been delivered. I mean, I w personally, when I looked this up, I thought it was actually more. Um, in terms of what's currently operational, so we've, had, we've got eight orbiters uh, which are orbiting Mars right now. USA, China, Russia, ESA, Japan, and to some surprise, India and the UAE. They're actually quite further along the space program than many people give them um, credit for. Landers, we've got USA and China, and then rovers, we've got three. We've got Curiosity and Perseverance in the USA, which you've probably heard about. And then we've got China's Zurong rover, which is the most recent lander. Um, this slide here is just a bit of history, so just very quickly because I'm against the clock. So this here was the very first picture of, of close-up picture of Mars taken. Um, so the Mariner 4 in 1965 by the USA, it was a flyby. And it actually led scientists to believe that Mars is very much like the moon, full of craters, which was only, only accurate to some part of Mars. Over here, we've got um, Mars 3. Oh, excuse you. Um, <laughs> Mars 3, so um, that was the very first lander uh, by the USSR. Um, so they did have, have some achievements. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, the very first lander, 1971. And it took this picture here, which, um, which I mean, you can still actually decipher something. So you can see the rocky terrain, uh, and then you can see a dust storm. And it actually only being back 20 seconds or 15 seconds, there's a big scientific debate about this, of data before basically the dust storm in encompassed it. And, and the USSR was like, um, their, 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 their demon was uh, the Mars dust storms. They really... Uh, uh, launched at the wrong time and they got encompassed by the dust storms. The first, the first real success was the USA, the Viking 1 lander, and it took that picture there of the lander leg in 1976. Right, I've taken too long on that slide, so I'm going to have to speed up. Um, so why have so many failed? Well, we've had like a whole host of reasons. Every reason under the sun, launches, not making it into space for starters. We've had um, spacecraft failing in low Earth orbit even before they go off to Mars. Um, computers failing, that's a big, big one. Electrics failing. Um, uh, I suppose one of the most infamous ones really was um, uh, a, uh, uh, a metric, no, a, an imperial to metric conversion error, which was uh, yeah, pinpointed to one person, and you really wanted, wanted to be that person. Uh, um, yeah, that's every engineer's worst nightmare. Um, that's why we were at late hours in the space industry. Um, so there was that, and then, and then, and then you have like uh, issues. So if you burn your engines too late at Mars, you just simply fly, fly past. We've had a few spacecraft fly past, 
And then when, when you come to land, you've got, you've got issues. So um, you can have um, uh, your retro rockets not, not firing at the right time, parachutes at, um, cutting off at the wrong time. This here is Beagle 2. Do you know Beagle 2? No, Pillinger, he was a very uh, eccentric character. Anyway, um, it was a U UK spacecraft on a budget. Made it, <laughs> made it to Mars by a miracle. And um, uh, many people thought it crash landed, but it actually didn't. Um, it, it made it to Mars, but one of its last solar panels failed to unfurl. And as a result, it blocked the communications dish back to Earth. Yeah, re a real shame. And um, yeah, it, uh, it was uh, declared a failure. Um, but yeah, we've had other reasons. Um, I mean, the Opportunity rover died because dust settled on its solar arrays because of the dust storms and it starved of power. And this here is a picture of the Curiosity rover, which is still in operation. Um, and um, yeah, its wheel is being broken up by the rocks, as you can see. So the main challenges, I'll just whittle through this, it's mainly due to the distance to the design challenges. Um, so the distance means that we put the spacecraft into hibernation and just before Mars, we wake it up uh, and then it has to perform this key braking maneuver, um, which is key because if you miss it, miss it by five to 10 minutes, you sail straight on past, like I mentioned before. So um, because of the distance, we have this very large signal delay, speed of light, uh, three to five minutes. Um, so everything has to be done autonomously uh, and autonomously means we get a lot of failures. So uh, we have that to overcome. And then once you've overcome the braking maneuver, quite often you're hit straight away with that seven minutes of doom, uh, which is the, uh, the re-entry sequence, again, all autonomously. Um, and then we have Mars's atmosphere to deal with. So it's notoriously difficult. It's just thick enough to cause thermal issues, but it's not thick enough uh, to allow parachutes to do all the work. So this means that we have to use a whole host of braking devices. So we have the heat shield for thermal, two sets of parachutes, retro rockets, and then right at the last minute we either use airbags or we use something to kind of just soften that, that touchdown. Once we've landed, we've got the rocky terrain, dust storms. So the global dust storms encompass Mars every three years, and, it, and it's all over the planet, and it lasts about one to four months. So uh, we really try to avoid those periods. And then we've got the surface temperatures to finally deal with. So we've got minus 140 degrees in the winter to 21 degrees in the summer. A typical day could go from 20 degrees to minus 70 degrees. So that causes havoc with design. Okay, so latest Mars landing. So latest is actually China's Tianwen. I'm probably saying it horrendously wrong. But Tianwen lander and the Zurong rover pictured here. What took the picture? I don't know. Conspiracy theory, I really don't know. I did try to find that out. Uh, and then over here we've got the NASA's uh, Perseverance rover, which you're probably more familiar with, uh, and the Ingenuity uh, helicopter. Um, and this was delivered by the Sky Crane system. And the Sky Crane system is a little bit like Tom Cruise, <laughs> a little bit, uh, in the original Mission Impossible movie, where he's dangling over the high security floor. It's, it's kind of the same concept of how Perseverance was delivered to the Martian floor. And here, hopefully it works, I've got the historic footage. Constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Pretty cool footage, right? <laughs> it was a well party that night, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, just some quick facts about that. So, Perseverance hit the Martian atmosphere at over 10,000 miles an hour, and then the, the parachute broke, uh, sort of broke the speed to about 200 miles an hour, and then the Sky Crane system sort of reduced it down to about four to five miles an hour. So, huge decrease in speed. 
Okay, so what this talk is about, I know I'm running a little bit late, but um, um, it's about the Perseverance rover, really. So that's phase one of the Mars sample return mission. And uh, its, its primary mission, really, is to search for signs of past ancient life, um, not, not current life, unfortunately, um, and, uh, and to perform what we call sample caching. So uh, the Perseverance rover is armed with a variety of drill bits. We see a picture of a drill bit in the far right. Uh, and it's also armed with 43 sample tubes. And uh, basically it drives around and it identifies rocks of interest via its uh, Watson and Sherlock camera, which is on the end of this long stick. Um, and it takes a rock sample, so that there is a picture in the middle of uh, the very first rock sample taken. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it stores the rock sample in the sample tube, and then the rock sample is taken into the rover's belly. A picture is taken, picture here. Uh, and then, yeah, effectively the sample is sealed, and it's stored in the rover's belly. It drives around, keeps on doing this, and then when it reaches a certain number, those samples are dropped, deposited on the surface of Mars, ready for a future pickup mission. Uh, because the rover doesn't have, uh, basically, the, the the high-level fidelity um, uh, apparatus that we have here on Earth. Uh, it would be too expensive to launch it. What is worth mentioning, I'll just mention it very quickly, is that some of those, some of those sample tubes um, are what we call witness tubes, and they're actually, I mean, it, to be honest, it, it surprised me w w uh, when I researched this. Um, those witness tubes, about four or five, have a little bit of Earth material in them, and basically they do the job that it, that it, that's on the, on the tin, like one sill. Um, it it, it um, samples the Martian atmosphere, so it absorbs the Martian atmosphere into the sample. And basically, scientists down the road can then determine what actually came from Mars and what came from Earth. Because believe it or not, the rover will actually outgas material over time, um, uh, just the nature of like uh, things in lower gravity. Uh, and also, um, you could have stuff, say, from the sky crane, unburnt pr uh, re uh, propellant residual, which could also contaminate your, your sample. Um, so uh, it's just scientists going to the nth degree. So like I said, perseverance is the first step. Then we have the sample retrieval lander, which is the next phase. And then we have the Earth return orbiter. So another two phases yet to follow, again, on two different launches. And they're, and they're due to launch in 2027, 2028. Uh, and they're kind of like the updated launch schedules. The sample retrieval landing mission, um, this will house the, uh, the lander, the sample fetch rover, and then the orb orbiting sample container and the Mars ascent vehicle, a lot of words there. Um, a last minute decision that has actually been made to Oh God, I'm running late. Um, a last minute decision <laughs> has been made to move away from this and go towards the sky crane system. I'll skip the reason why. Um, but yeah, hopefully this works. Yeah, a little video here of the little sample fetch rover developed by UK, by the way. Um, and it goes around at relatively high speeds for a rover, picks up the samples left by Perseverance on the Martian, Martian surface, drives away towards the Mars ascent vehicle, and uh, yeah, Mars Sun Vehicle has its own robotic arm, picks up those, those samples and loads them into the orbiting sample container, which is on the Mars Ascent Vehicle. And you see the Mars Ascent Vehicle blasting off there. This is a very absolute first for space in general. We have never launched anything off any other foreign body ever. I mean, bar from men, actually, on the moon. But <laughs> any other any other planet, so I was actually correct there, yeah, so, um, yeah, it's an absolute first, that design is really under review, but the contracts have been awarded in the US and it has started to kick off. Um, here are just some quick videos about the development activities on this sample retrieval lander, so I have to go over here, so hopefully this works. That was the lander. Okay. Uh, here we have the uh, sample fetch rover wheels being tested by NASA. So it's a very special uh, metal uh, uh, memory shape alloy. Uh, and then just before I play this video here, um, uh, in the previous pictures it showed a picture of the Mars Ascent vehicle being launched vertically. Can't do that. 
um, because um, there's a risk that the whole lander will topple over. So instead, the scientists have come up with an incredibly novel way of tossing the rocket up in the air and then igniting the engines. I mean, you can't make this shit up. <laughs> uh, hopefully, where is it there? Three, two, one, fire. This test that we just did uh, goes a long way to showing um, that it's possible. That this is the correct path to go down to have a successful launch on Mars. Once the samples have left the surface of Mars... Three. Oh, no, we don't want to watch again. Um, right, so the final part of the saga, part three, is the Earth return orbiter. And this is the part that I'm actually most involved in. Um, it's mainly an ESA-run mission, and a large majority of it is built by the UK. Um, yeah, so the ERO will be the largest ever spacecraft to, to, to arrive at Mars. It's, once it has its solar arrays deployed, it will be 40 meters in, in, in width, I suppose, which is the size of your commercial airline when you go on holiday. Huge spacecraft. And it will arrive about a year early, and it will, a um, year earlier to the uh, samples being launched, and it will provide the relay signal communication link between the sample fetch rover, it, and Earth. And then once the samples are launched off the surface of Mars, it will then perform the rendezvous with the samples, track them down, and then it will capture them using the NASA uh, Capture and Containment and Return System. Um, very accurate name. Um, and uh, yeah, so this here is a, it's kind of like a very small schematic of that payload, we call it. And um, yeah, the samples will be captured uh, in what we call the primary containment vessel. Uh, and then a robotic arm will pick that sample up, put it into the Earth entry system, and that goes into a secondary containment vessel. And then a back shell goes on that, and then all of a sudden the um, ERO, like, we, like what, what we like to call it, we, like, we love our acronyms in space, will fire its, fire its electric engines back towards Earth. And then once we're near Earth, um, it will perform its final maneuver whereby the Earth entry system will... Um, be deployed towards Earth, uh, but then the ERO will actually perform an Earth avoidance maneuver. And you're probably, asking, probably wondering, why do we do that? Um, well, it does it, and it fires engines towards the sun, actually, in a heliocentric orbit. Um, and it's all to protect the Earth's biosphere, because we don't know what we're picking up from Mars. There could be microbes, very unlikely, but there could be. So we do this final maneuver towards Earth, because the ERO... Uh, could have picked up microbes in Martian orbit. Potentially, it's been orbiting there for a year, or it could have picked it up because it's contained. It's captured the sort of primary uh, orbiting sample container before it's gone into a primary containment vessel and then a secondary containment containment vessel. All these sort of like uh, barriers towards uh, having a massive outbreak of alien life on Earth. So, this is just a final video. Uh, just to kind of bring all that together and it probably explains it a lot better. And just the last slide, really. So you saw then 2031, so I previously said 2032. Oh, no, actually, actually, I think I missed that bit, actually. Crap. <laughs> so the Earth entry system is going to come in hot 
Uh, so without a parachute, and it's going to come in around about 2032, 2033, uh, land in the Utah desert, um, and yeah, then scientists basically pick it up uh, and analyze it to death all across the laboratories of the world. Um, but I mean, those dates are likely to slip. So yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so 2035 could could be the, the final date. That that will be the absolute latest. Um, but you know, if Elon Musk has his way. Starship will hopefully be there. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm a big fan of, of Elon Musk. Hopefully be there in 2030, and the, the sample fetch rover is picking up the samples, and hopefully men just jump out and pick the samples up and bring them back. That is the hope. But what's for certain is that, you know, space exploration has an exciting future, and, you know, let's watch this space. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's very much on the failure. Sorry, That's, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like dependency. Um, I mean, we often get failures in space. I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong. I mean, uh, one thing I didn't touch on was radiation plays a big part as well. Radiation sends everything into haywire electronics. Um, yeah, I mean, if we fly past, we're not going to get pictures of anything. Um, but if we capture the Mars orbit, there is a possibility we, we, we could do something. I mean, with this Mars sample return mission. Um, kind of a any major failure is the end of not retrieving any samples. Um, it, it really is a kind of wild, out there kind of project, which is why it's such, it's such an exciting project to work on. Um, I would say that the sample fetch rover, which I mentioned, um, Perseverance does have the ability, possibly, to bring the samples back to the Mars Ascent vehicle. Um, but the scientists work off worst case, so Perseverance has a design life of two years, uh, but it has a nuclear power plant on board which is capable of 14. So when these missions are launched, you know, 2027 I said or something like that, it'll be about six, seven, eight years old maybe, and so the likelihood is that Perseverance could deliver the samples back. So there is a little bit of, there is, w in, in space industry we love redundancy. Redundancy is where it's at. So you don't have one of anything, have two. And sometimes we have three. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. When you caught the samples, it made it look really easy. <laughs> <laughs> How big was that whole window? Um, and is it actually that easy? <laughs> How big is the whole story? Like the window that it's like catching. Oh, sorry. Right, I need to repeat the question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so the question was: um, uh, Is it easy to capture the samples? Um, how big is the hole? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's it, it's incredibly hard. It really is. I mean, that is a, it's a scientific feat in itself. It's an app. Oh well. Um, I'm just trying to think. I think, it, yeah, th that it really is a, an, a, an absolute first. I mean, w we're used to docking in space, low Earth orbit. We've kind of perfected it. And it, that's building on that technology. But to do it fully, fully autonomously without any human intervention is, is, is something else. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah, it's hard. Oh, well, oh, in terms of the size of the payload, oh, uh, I, I think we're talking about... Yes. Yeah, another question related to the video actually is how much fuel does it need to take to be able to shoot something back to Earth? So coming back to Earth is fully electric. Okay. Yeah, so the ho the reason why um, it's the uh, Earth return orbiter is so large is because it has huge solar arrays. Um, and um, going out towards Mars, we use a mixture of chemical and solar, um, well, electric. Uh, but majority of it is electric up until the point we do that chemical burn where we capture. And the reason why we need chemical, old-fashioned technology, Apollo era, is because it has the highest impulse. It, has, it gives us the biggest oomph um, that, 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 at the moment, electric just can't give. 
electric is very good at very slow burning um, constantly. So we turn the electric engines on, for instance, uh, over the Mars sample, over the, the cruise period for probably about 130 days. Uh, and they're constantly firing, and that's basically building up our acceleration because we've got nothing to push against us. Um, but in order to give us that, that huge like, decrease in speed, we need a chemical propulsion. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Avoiding that area over there. Some tricky questions coming in. <laughs> um, while we were on the uh, sample retrieval landing mission slide, yeah. you realised we were running out of time and skipped something and mentioned the sky crane. And so what, what was the reason mm -hmm. that you skipped telling us that? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it was just about um, the reason why um, they've made this very knee-jolt reaction very recently. I mean, it was in it was kind of in the space news world, so not not in the press. <laughs> um, uh, about probably about three weeks ago, uh, whereby they they decided at ministerial level, ESA, because this is all kind of like ESA and NASA level. Uh, that they would um, go back towards the sky crane system over this descent stage. Uh, and the reason is, is is because they they started to exceed in mass. I mean, the Apollo era really struggled with, with, with controlling mass. Mass always increases in, in space. You start off with a design and it always increases in mass. Um, yeah, they, they really struggled with mass uh, and this descent stage all of a sudden was becoming uh, beyond anything that had landed before so they then looked towards a sky crane system which is like a very heavy payload delivery basically delivering a, a car on on the surface of mars and they know that it works so um they go into that there's still a little bit of uncertainty as to whether or not they might separate the um sample fetch rover and the mars ascent vehicle in two separate i mean that is very much like you know being talked about right now. So fresh off the press, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you can, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, you sort of touched it now at the end, but um, you sort of, I saw an interview with Elon Musk yes. talking about getting into the Mars in 10 years or whatever. Um, so how realistic is that? And what are the, like, it sounds like you have the technology to get to Mars. Okay, so you had to oh yeah, I didn't repeat the questions. Have I just repeated that? No, I sorry I didn't repeat that quite I just remembered. No, so the question was um how much of, of, of a challenge is I'm gonna abbreviate here, is um Elon Musk's sort of quest to land on Mars uh, with humans. Um, yeah, that was a huge one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when do I think it's going to happen? Um, so, yeah, I mean, Elon Musk is um, he's great in terms of um, creating excitement, and he, he honestly, he he really is a uh, he clears the way. He sort of breaks down barriers uh, within, within the space industry, um, but he's also very bad at time prediction, um, and. <laughs> We're not going to be having people on Mars in 2030. Um, there's too many. When it, when manned space missions come into come into play, you have to go through every single. You know, NASA gets involved, and you just see it with the with the um, with the Dragon spacecraft. They were delay after delay after delay, and that will be the same for Mars. You might get, in all honesty, you might get a a Mars shot in 2030. That is a possibility of Starship. Starship is on such a fast track. I mean, this year alone, Starship is due to orbit Earth. I mean, that is incredible. Oh, sorry, Mars shot is like a moon shot. So it basically, uh, it will like break around Mars and then come back to Earth. Um, but yeah, in terms of landing humans on Mars, uh, we're, we're talking, my personal opinion, we're talking late, late 2030s. I think that's always been the NASA sort of uh, standard uh, reply. And is there a reason you want <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a very good question, yeah. And this is a fierce, yeah. Oh, sorry. The question was, yeah. Would we want, um, would we want 
uh, do we want humans on Mars over robots? I mean, Mars is a very inhospitable place. It, it, it really is. Um, why we want to live there, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole nuke Mars situation, and yes, that that would work theoretically, but over many, 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 many years. Um, robots is the best way. It's it's the best way to send to develop our own technology to help us here on Earth. I mean, that's often the the, the, the argument that's used against space is like, why bother? You know, why don't we just focus on building hospitals or whatever? And uh, you know, that that is the biggest offshoot. But um, uh, yeah, I, I'd always say manned exploration is just something that. I mean, I'm gonna obviously gonna be biased, but my, but it's the same as Everest. It's there. You wanna you wanna you wanna walk it. So um, it's just something that I feel we want to do. And it makes life exciting, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> so a question from your brother right now. So um, when can a spacecraft come back to Earth and within the Earth's orbit? Is there kind of a concern around space junk or already orbiting spacecraft around Earth? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so and how, how do you mitigate that? So when, when spacecraft come back to Earth, yeah. you know, is there a... Or, or launched initially. Uh, how do you account for spacecraft that already is? Oh, okay. Is there a concern about space junk and, and colliding with it? So actually, there was a, there was a previous Nerd Night uh, talk about space junk. Um, and um, there are efforts to clean up space, believe it or not, um, because it is becoming a little bit congested over the, um, over the years. Um, but... Yeah, when we launch, actually, we do take it into consideration because um, certain electronics are hardened, um, so we put extra metal, extra thickness of metal around critical, you know, single points of failure, just in case a little piece of um, debris was a striker's. Um, but yeah, in terms of re-entry, I mean, um, Earth's quite vast. Um, we can burn stuff up in... Um, Earth's atmosphere quite easily, just like a meteorite would. But there are studies out there whereby it shows that certain materials could actually influence, because we're burning up very high in the atmosphere, could actually influence climate change. So the space industry is trying to get to grips with this, because it's very, very novel. Uh, at the moment, we're at a stage whereby space is becoming almost accessible to kind of not everyone, but a lot, you know, not just governments anymore, it's the private companies. And there has to be protocol there to basically uh, protect space. Because we don't want to be in a situation whereby we can't launch safely out into space because space is dangerous. Because, uh, for instance, a speck of paint, just, just a speck of paint, cr um, created a crack in the ISS's window. So that shows you how dangerous it is, because these things are traveling at the speed of a bullet. And if you get in the wrong path of it, then uh, you know it's game over. Sorry, that's really <laughs> negative. <laughs> Space is great. <laughs> All right. Oh, in the far corner. Yes, in the far corner. You mentioned about the using the difference between conventional rockets and electric engines. Yeah. Well, I kind of get our chemical rocket that produces thrust. How do how do you generate thrust in space with electric? Okay, so the question was, um, yeah, how do we generate thrust um, with uh, electric engines? So, um, so I'm, well, I'll give you the, the sort of broad view because I'm chemical biased, big chemical engines burning. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, no, we have we have we have arc jet thrusters, um, we have um, Hall effect thrusters, and and this is effectively we we still need uh, propellant. We can't get away from propellant at the moment, so we still. So, for instance, the the most commonly used electric propulsion propellant is xenon, uh, and xenon has its own problems. A lot of it comes from Russia, so um, that is a big problem at the moment. A third of it comes from Russia, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, we we basically uh, we tamper with the electrons in that uh, propellant, uh, accelerate them, and then we put them through some sort of nozzle, uh, and then uh, yeah, we. we we get thrust. That's that's. Sorry. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, and iron. So we have iron thrusters, arc jet thrusters. Those are the two big ones. Um, so for an, on MSR, for instance, I think they're using they're using ion thrusters. Um, and I know that. Well, I, know, I probably shouldn't say actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, I probably shouldn't. Say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the rover is looking for rocks of interest to pick up. What, is, what exactly is it looking for? Obviously, we want them to come back with signs of life. Yeah. Um, so how, does it, how does it know what rocks to pick up, or is it just picking up other rocks? Yeah, so the question was, um, uh, how does the rover, oh, how does the rover kind of decipher what rocks to pick up? Um, uh, yeah, could it, could it just pick up any old rock and pick it back um, and bring it back? Um, yeah, so it has this Watson and Sherlock. Uh, so the Watson is a camera, and the Sherlock is a uh, is a kind of like a a very light sp um, um, spectrometer. Uh, so uh, the the camera takes a picture, it sends it back to the scientist back here on Earth. They decipher it, uh, and then at the same time, um, the Sherlock uh, will 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 sort of pinpoint what organic compounds are in that. Um, uh, in that rock sample, um, and whether or not it's worth actually taking a sample of it. So the one slide that I did have, which I deleted, which because yeah, sorry, yeah, it was uh, it was about the Ingenuity helicopter, because I didn't have time. Um, but um, yeah, the Ingenuity helicopter has actually been it's performed so well that it's now performing a scouting activity for the Perseverance rover. So it's it's flying around. It's on its 25th flight, um, and it's now scouting for the Perseverance rover. Um, and it's basically identifying areas of interest to scientists here on Earth, whereby Perseverance will then drive to and then take samples of. So Perseverance actually, as of yesterday, has just arrived to the um, Jezero uh, Delta, they call it, which is the, um, the entrance to the mouth of the ancient river. Um, and it's here where they think they're going to collect the most precious samples. Uh, so yeah, so um, hopefully there's, there's, there's good things to come. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, for those that don't know about Mars, Mars did once hold water. I mean, that's been scientifically proven. And it was, a, it was a really a, an oasis back in the day. I mean, obviously not now, but um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, it, it's all about trying to prove out there that life did exist. Um, and, it, it, and if that is proven, that really is one of life's biggest questions answered. <laughs>